An old man appeared at the forum. Filthy and malnourished, he was no more than a shadow of his former self. But the people could still recognize him. He used to be a respected centurion and had many scars to show for it. The crowd grew large and questioned the man. He told them that, while he was out there defending the Republic, his field was burned and his property plundered. He was then asked to pay war tax when he was least able to. He then fell into debt and ultimately lost his freedom at the hands of his creditor. In the early Republic, people who couldn't pay off their debt would be bound to their creditor. They would have to work his field until the debt was paid. Unfortunately for the debtors, they couldn't earn any money while serving the creditor. This left them in a perpetual state of servitude. Recent wars bankrupted many former soldiers, and the question of debt relief became a major political issue. A large crowd of angry debtors gathered in the forum. They surrounded the consuls and showed them their chains. These, they said, were their rewards for serving Rome. The Senate was called into session to deal with the mob. While they were discussing the matter, news of the Volscian invasion reached the city. The consuls dismissed the Senate and tried to levy the army. But the men refused to answer the call, saying, let the patricians take up arms and serve as common soldiers, that those who get the spoils of war may share its perils. Furious, the Senate appointed a dictator to crush this revolt. However, they chose a man beloved by the plebs, Manius Valerius, the brother of the famous Publicola. After he assured the people that the debt crisis would be resolved once the enemies were defeated, they wow. eagerly took up arms. The Sabines, Volskins, and Equi were all easily defeated, one after the other, and the victorious legion marched back home to the city. There they were met with disappointment, as the powerful patricians blocked Manius from fulfilling his promises. He resigned as dictator, refusing to give false hope to his fellow citizens. Seeing there was no other way, the plebs marched out of the city and occupied the Sacred Mount, a hill north of Rome. This event is known as the secession of the plebs. Both sides were growing restless, as the city was defenseless without its armies. The Senate had no other choice but to send an envoy to negotiate with the plebs. The question of debt relief was not directly addressed. Instead, a new office was created, the Tribune of the Plebs. The tribunes were sacrosanct, meaning that to hurt them or ignore their veto was a religious offense punishable by death. With their divine protection, the tribunes could act against patricians without any fear. The tribunes became increasingly more important, reaching their peak with the Gracchi brothers around 125 BC and fell into obsolescence with the rise of emperors. In the years after the secession, constant raids from neighboring tribes left Rome at the brink of starvation. To prevent it, the Senate imported large quantities of grain from Sicily. In this grain, some patricians saw an opportunity to regain the powers conceded to the plebs. Foremost among them was Gaius Marcius Coriolanus, a respected general. He demanded the abolition of tribunes in exchange for fair grain prices. This didn't go well with the people. In fact, they revolted. The patricians agreed to hold a trial to ease the tensions. He was exiled from the city and took refuge with the Volskins. Seeking revenge, he persuaded the Volskian army to march on Rome. He led them from one victory to another, capturing many Roman towns until they reached the gates of Rome itself. While Coriolanus was besieging Rome, his mother snuck out to his camp and pleaded with him to stop the assault. Deeply moved by her cries, he withdrew his army. Feeling cheated out of an easy victory, Volskins murdered Coriolanus. It should be noted that this story predates the sack of Rome in 390 BC, when all historical records were lost. It bears a striking resemblance to the story of Athenian general Themistocles, who also took refuge among his enemy. We can safely assume it was made up by later Romans, who couldn't believe that Rome was defeated by anyone other than a fellow Roman. Although the masses were satisfied with newly acquired power in the form of a tribune, it didn't take long for a new generation of plebs to demand even more rights. To prevent new reforms, armies were levied each campaigning season. The total dominance of the legions could not be denied, and the plebs started questioning the real reason behind these constant wars. They reverted to their old tactics of refusing to enlist. These cycles would repeat for the next 20 odd years. Despite many reforms being successfully blocked, the plebs did score some major political victories. Lex Publilia, 
a law passed in 471 BCE, transferred the power of electing tribunes from Comitia Centuriata to Comitia Tributa. Membership in the Tributa was not based on personal wealth, but rather on the place of residence, and thus was the most democratic form of the Roman Republic. Furthermore, in 457 BCE, the number of tribunes was increased to 10, remaining so until the end of the Republic. These internal power struggles between the rich and the poor, the patricians and the plebs, is called the conflict of the orders, and it would last for another century or two. During the regal period, Rome's sphere of influence grew to cover the whole of Latium. The expulsion of the monarchs and subsequent turmoil left Rome in a weakened position, with much of the expansionist progress being lost. But it wouldn't take long for the new republic to match and eventually surpass the dead monarchy. Rebelling Latins were subdued with the victory in the Battle of Lake Regulus. A decisive victory against the Equi would set Rome up for an inevitable clash with the Etruscans for the ultimate control of central Italy. If we ever stop to consider how a city from central Italy grew to an empire spanning the entire Mediterranean and lasting millennia, we should look back at these generations. Famine and pestilence were almost a yearly occurrence, but the legions kept marching forth. If an army was utterly defeated, the dead were buried and a new army sprung to take its place. Rome was handed one severe defeat after another, but it never stood for peace. The legions kept coming until the enemy was forced to surrender from sheer exhaustion. From these generations, much was asked and nothing was given in return. Despite all these external pressures, the plebs would not give up on their dream of equality, eventually passing a law so consequential that the entire Western legal tradition is based on it. Join us next time as we discuss the 12 tables of Roman law. <laughs>